some tips now for suturing that might be very interesting for you or things that might help you would be that you want to use a reverse cutting needle. So we're going to talk about this in another video, but a reverse cutting needle has a cross section similar to what we see here. It's this little inverted triangle. The cutting edge is along the convex surface of that needle, meaning that it's not going to pull through the tissues as easily as would a cutting suture needle. And a cutting suture needle would have a triangle that's facing the other way. Cutting edge would be on the concave, the concave surface sorry, of the needle. When you're working with gut sutures, make sure that when you take it out of the package, you use a wet gauze. So take a gauze that's wet and run it along that suture to pull it tight and get some of the kinks out of there. If you've worked with this suture and it's been sitting on the tray drying out, same thing, use a wet gauze to go through, wipe any blood or residue off of there. Keep it nice and wet so that it's sliding nicely through the tissues. If this is dry, it's going to be sticking to the tissues like nobody's business. It's going to be hard to pull that through and it's not going to work quite like it was intended. These sutures are often fairly long when you take them out, which can make them difficult or cumbersome to handle. Just snip it off. Take off a big chunk of it. Only have what you need. You might only need to place one or two sutures. Why have a whole big long arm's length of suture material there to deal with when you're trying to put in one or two simple interrupted sutures? Whenever possible, try to suture so that your knot will end up on the buckle surface of an extraction site. The reason I say that is because it's out of the way, kind of far away from the tongue. Your patient will have less propensity to try to poke at it or play with it, which is going to mean that it's going to come untied much less than if you left your knots on the palatal aspect or the lingual aspect of the teeth. Sometimes for whatever reason, and I'm not sure why this is, but it might just be the way that it kind of works with your movements. For me anyways, when I'm passing through the interproximal area of the teeth, backhanded movements seem to be a lot easier for me to scoop in and get through the interproximal region. So see what you can do. You might need a forehand movement as well. Either way is going to work. Backhand for me seems to feel more natural and seems to glide through a little bit more easily. Deeper sutures will absorb better. So if you're using a gut suture, you will find that if you place it deeper in the tissue or take a kind of a deeper path of insertion when you go through the tissues, you're going to get into some different tissue layers that are going to handle these sutures better to absorb them in a quicker amount of time. Anytime that you place a suture and you're leaving that little tail on the end there, one nice thing to do would be to have your assistant basically suctioning on the small end or the short end that's there. So let's say that we throw this through the tissue here. We've got one thin small end here and we're going to have our assistant holding this with a surgical suction and it basically just kind of rattles around in that suction until you're ready to grab it. That keeps it free from all the saliva and sticking to the tissues or the tongue. Sometimes if you don't do this, this suture tail is going to find itself somewhere and be stuck there and it's a little bit tougher to grab. So it's easier to grab it from the surgical suction than it is from other sites in the mouth. Make sure that if you are suturing to stop a bleed that you have visualized well inside of that socket and that you keep an eye on that patient. Suturing something that's bleeding from deep in the socket or somewhere from within the tissues, tossing the gauze in and sending a patient home is not good practice. You can sometimes have a bleed that will continue to expand into a hematoma and you've sutured over top thinking that you're stopping that bleed by applying pressure and really in fact you're just trapping it inside and getting rid of any escape route for that blood so it's actually going to be causing more trouble. So make sure that you identify the bleeding area before you suture over. Suturing however for hemostasis is a good practice if you're mo managing the patient properly and monitoring them afterwards. Sutures will be labeled as say 3O, 4O, 5O, all the way up to like 10O and we don't use those kind of things here. We might use up to maybe a 5 or 6O in dentistry. Now basically what that means is as we add more O's, more zeros, those sutures are getting smaller in their cross-sectional diameter. So the suture itself is getting thinner the more O's that we're adding. Now the smaller the suture, kind of the more delicate the suturing. So if you have a torn flap, for example, you might want to use a, say, 6O or a 5O suture that's going to be much finer than, say, a 3O suture that you may use normally for good strength uh, to resist the tissue pull in an area where you've done a surgical flap.
If you take proper bites, so say that you take proper bites that are about maybe three millimeters from the tissue edges, then what you're going to find is you're going to have a better chance of everting the tissues when things are approximated. So if you pull this through at the proper distance, when you go to close this up, you're going to find that the tissues come together very, very nicely and the tissue edges kind of stand up a little bit. So as this starts to heal and that tissue begins to retract a little bit, it's going to lay down flatter. Now in the mouth, scarring is not a huge deal, but there are areas that are in the aesthetic zone where if you can avoid suturing in those areas, you want to make sure that you're doing it properly by everting those edges, which means entering at a 90 degree perpendicular angle to the tissues and everting those edges slightly by taking the nice appropriately sized bites of two to three millimeters from your incision line. Finally, if you are brave enough, and I shouldn't even say brave enough, but say someone comes in with a laceration on the face, they are in a situation where they have a cut extra orally, and you're maybe in a location where there aren't people who can suture these things up, it's just you, you're in a remote location. If you are suturing these things, you want to make sure that you're using a non-absorbable suture. Now, if you use an absorbable suture to close up a facial wound, what can happen is you can get epithelialization of the tissue tract where that needle has passed through and you'll leave some permanent scarring there from where the needle passed. So you have less chance of having these suture tunnels epithelialize if you're using non-absorbable sutures. I've never been quite so brave as to suture an extra oral laceration. I usually pass that along and I would suggest that you do as well. So these are some cool tips, I guess, for suturing. We're gonna cover way more in the coming videos. Just stick with it, watch some of these videos. You're gonna be really good at suturing by the time you're finished this. Certainly confident enough to tackle anything that involves a flap to remove a tooth.